Greetings all. Okay, we're doing something a little bit different here. I have come to the Sullivan Cup and the lads at Textron have brought something which will pose me a significant problem that I will get to in a moment. But standing next to me is Clark, who is gonna give us the, the tour and the sales pitch as to what this thing is, the designation for which I don't even know. What is it? So this is the M5 uh, robotic combat vehicle. Uh, so the platform itself uh, is identical to the one that we've delivered. You know, we delivered for them to the United States Army uh, back last spring. And is type uh, classified as the M5, or is that the sales Currently, team? I mean, that's, that's what we've classified it as. Uh, as you know, the Army will dis decide what the uh, nomenclature is once they, they finally accept these things. Okay. But we delivered four of them as part of the, the uh, RCV medium competition last year. All right, and so this is a, a variation on the same thing? Exactly. Or? So uh, the, the team at the Next Generation Combat Vehicle asked us to uh, put together a counter UAS uh, variant here. Mm -hmm. So what you see uh, is a variation on a system called Blades. It's a ballistic low altitude drone engagement system. Okay. Uh, so normally a blade system would have a 50 cal crows on it. Uh, we've kicked it up a notch, right? right. Uh, we're from Louisiana. Uh, so we've put a, a 30 by 113 on here. And that's it, a fused round? It is. Uh, and so it's, it's a, actually an EOS R400 turret mm -hmm. uh, slave to an SRC multi-mode radar. Uh, and that allows it to track both outgoing and incoming rounds uh, for, for counter drone engagement. So uh, we're talking observation drones, suicide drones, like switchblade? All, or all of the all above. Of the above. Uh, so last week at Fort Sill, uh, getting uh, solid hits um, at, at range uh, with this system. And the size of the drone, I mean, how small a drone will you, will you engage? Uh, it, it really depends on, on the, uh, I mean, uh, what we're trying to do. Or? Yeah, we've got a 762 for smaller stuff and for larger uh, drones we've got the, the 30 by 113. Will it have a secondary uh, active protection system for missiles? Uh, this one currently does not. No. Uh, obviously so it can't if, engage an in incoming missile then? Just a drone? It, yeah, it's not the design of okay. it. Yeah. Okay. It's more for drones. And then slave to that in the back is, is what's called uh, MGOC, the multi-mode ground obscurant capability. Okay. Uh, so what that is, is it's a maneuverable smart smoke launcher uh, that slaves to the turret. Mm -hmm. And then once the turret, uh, or once the operator decides that uh, it needs to put obscurant between it and the threat, uh, the smoke canister will light off. So it's a multi-spectral jet and stab, like maybe 50 yards and, and explodes? Correct, yeah. All right. So what is the vehicle that it's based on? I mean, you look at it immediately, you think Ripsaw. It's a, exactly what it's based off of. So uh, the platform itself is based off of uh, our M5 that we delivered to the Army. Uh, so it's a hybrid electric diesel, mm -hmm. uh, which means the, the diesel turns uh, or charges the batteries. Batteries then drive uh, the two 900 horsepower motors. So yes, you do the math. It's got 1800 horsepower. It's got more horsepower than an M1 tank at 12 and a half tons. Uh, and with 130 gallons of fuel, mm -hmm. so long as we are traveling below about 22 miles an hour, that allows us to charge the batteries at a rate greater than we're dissipating. And so we can get about 300 miles uh, off of a tank of gas with 130 gallons. Reminds you a bit of a diesel electric sub, really, doesn't That's it? That's exactly right. Okay, so does it have the silent mode option? Can you turn off the diesel entirely and just on a battery? Absolutely. Uh, so, it, as we were pulling in today, most people didn't realize that we were driving up here. Uh, it's completely quiet. It doesn't need the generator to operate. We get full power uh, off the batteries. For how long does that last? So, uh, it depends on conditions. Uh, because I'm thinking here now, not in the counter URS yeah. system, but just as a recon. Yeah, so from uh, just on the batteries, we can get about eight kilometers of movement without any uh, need to recharge. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you about 39 hours of silent watch. Okay. So obviously this is the RCV, not the optionally manned vehicle. Mm -hmm. So one, one of the things I like to do when I review a tank is the oh bugger, the tank is on fire test. Because I think it's very important to know how quickly I can get out of a tank if I need to. Yeah. I can't do that. There's no, there's no seating. This is pure robot. That's right. There's, there is no one in this vehicle. It's controlled by a common ground controller, uh, the one that we use to, to move it up here today, mm -hmm. very similar to an Xbox controller, uh, which makes it very useful to the, the young soldiers today. 
because uh, they're very comfortable with that. And does it have any level of autonomous capability or is everything just remote uh, radio control? So the autonomous capability is, is one of the things that the Army has said they want to work directly. Uh, we have demonstrated obviously is, is Textron Systems. Uh, we developed uh, the, uh, the Shadow UAV. Mm -hmm. uh, we've developed the Common Unmanned Sea Vehicle for the Navy, so we've got a lot of pedigree uh, in working on autonomous vehicles. Uh, but specifically, uh, for this program, the Army is developing the robotic technology kernel to develop the autonomy. All right. And is that for target engagement or for movement or both? All of the above. Interesting. Okay, so obviously then you're doing everything by cameras. I see cameras on the remote system. I see cameras on the front, cameras on the side. Uh, headlights? Yep. But the cameras are thermal, yes? So Camera, cameras are, are day channel, IR, and thermal. Oh, okay. So needs no lights. Uh, actually, it's as much of a safety thing as anything else. Uh, yeah, but, but making sure yeah. that you, you do have the ability to eliminate uh, if you're driving in a convoy. Okay. So of course you got bumpers on the front. Was it so a bush guard? So yeah, you know one of the challenges with uh, robotic vehicles is, is of course the operator is displaced from the vehicle itself. So. Uh, a, a very fast way to take track off of an armored vehicle is to put a tree in between uh, the track and the hull. Right. And, and so these guards allow us to protect against the, uh, the, the happenstance of, of having a tree or something come in between the, the tracks uh, and the hull. Right. It's always been, people ask me what about unmanned tanks as the future. Somebody's always going to have to go out with a tow cable and hook up a tracked vehicle once it gets mired because you went somewhere you shouldn't. It, it is it is a consideration. Uh, you know, one of the the ways that that we hedge against that is by creating a vehicle that has such good mobility uh, that it just doesn't get stuck. Stuck in the now, first place. You and I both know, as as uh, uh, a former tanker and a tanker, uh, that that when it comes down to it, you anybody can get something stuck. Uh, but incredibly capable when it starts to you start talking about the power that this has. Uh, the suspension itself is designed to run with the M1 tank, uh, so I mean it'll, you know, it'll do the uh, so since the it's climb electric, test. It's as fast backwards as forwards. That's correct. Uh, what's the zero to sixty time then? I presume it'll get the sixty. I, I don't know what the the actual time is. Uh, it's incredibly fast, uh, and it's quiet because with the band track and the electric motors, you don't hear it moving. Gotcha. From hundred meters away, you can't hear the vehicle. So as I'm looking at the uh, hydro struts, is the main suspension now? Or is there anything inside as well, inside the arm? No, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, and then, you know, traditional uh, rear drive on, on this system uh, with your compensating idler for track adjustment. Uh, we've got designs where the, the track actually uh, automatically adjusts. Oh, I like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> makes a big difference. Uh, don't have to get out there and do track adjustment. But uh, a lot less problems with band track than, than traditional track. So the, uh, I'm not, this is like a long reinforcing strut just for the comp idler? Mm-hmm. Sometimes like you're expecting some shocks at the front end. It so happens. Bump stops, obviously. So you're talking about a, a let's say what, like an eight inch range of motion? A bit more? Uh, a bit more. So we've got a bogey here. So this entire bogey is, looks like unsprung, but the main bogey is sprung. Is the way that looks like. Correct. The wheels, they're totally molded plastic? Uh, it's a combination. Uh, so th there's there's uh, metallic capability, there's plastic, uh, and then yeah, so it's uh, the, plastic the, the rubber. All the way down to at least yeah. here. Yeah. Inside there's, uh, the, there's other material. Gotcha. And I am looking at cabling. Oh, this is for the strut system, isn't it? So spare, uh, the BII for the vehicle, is it stored on the vehicle or would that be on the command vehicle? So you store it uh, actually in these compartments. So this is all just storage outside of the hull uh, over the track. So uh, the, the BII that you would traditionally have with this, of course it's a little bit different because it's an unmanned platform, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly things that you would need to have uh, to do adjust for stuff like that. Uh, plenty of storage all the way around. Uh, so every, every morning when you wake up, you got to do PMCS. I presume, on, on the track yeah. vehicle. How long would it take your, let's say, a two-man crew to PMCS this thing in the morning? It's actually very quick, and, and one of the things that we recognize is because it's an unmanned, uncrewed vehicle, you know, the Army's intent with this is to reduce uh, the amount of maintenance. And so uh, working through the, the 
the vehicle prognostics uh, so that the vehicle tells you when it needs something needs to be fixed as opposed to, oh crap, I just broke something. Uh, so, but, but very maintenance, uh, low maintenance intensive in terms of the band track, track adjustments, all of that stuff. Essentially, you're looking at uh, uh, the vehicle charge rate, uh, the di onboard diagnostics, uh, and, and that's about it. And bore, uh, bore side is done how often, would you say? We'll see. Uh, I mean, we've got the, uh, uh, the four vehicles that were delivered to the United States Army uh, have the MCT-30 cannon uh, on them, and so the MCT-30, I should say, and they're being tested in Hood, I believe, yes? Uh, they will go to Hood eventually. Uh, they're up at Aberdeen right now, and oh, so okay. those vehicles uh, then uh, get uh, bore-sided uh, about commensurate with, with what you would see out of a Striker 30. Gotcha. Uh, is there any ballistic protection to it, or is it just try to keep it as light as you can? So w one of the great uh, capabilities of this is, is with our robotic combat vehicle, I don't have to protect a crew. Uh, and so rather what I have to do is protect critical components. And so we have the ability uh, to uh, augment, increase, decrease based off of the mission, uh, the profile that the vehicle will, will experience. Gotcha. So as I'm driving around tracked vehicles, they always get very dusty and I'm looking at cameras and I don't even see squirty things, the you know, windshield wipe, wipe or fluid as it were. Yeah. How do you keep them clean? So it's, it's a great question. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, both uh, NGCV and PM ground combat systems have challenged all of industry with is, is how do we keep these things clean? Uh, and it's a problem set that everybody's working towards. Uh, there are a variety of different solutions that, that we have worked on from air jets, uh, which actually are incredibly useful, okay. uh, to water to hydrophobic coatings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we've gone through, you know, literally thousands of hours of testing uh, and with minimal engagement uh, with just proper coatings on the, the lenses themselves, uh, you still get full effective use of, of the uh, 360 system. Cool. Okay, so the back of the vehicle, I am looking at a whole lot of uh, additional plugs. Are they for diagnostics or Yeah, so, so obviously with a prototype vehicle, uh, there's a lot of things that we're doing on this vehicle that we wouldn't necessarily do on an operational uh, system, right? So I wouldn't want to have a big button that says emergency stop on the back. <laughs> Fair point. That, that's bad for the, the, the bad guys. Uh, but, you know, as, as the Army tries to learn how to use robotic combat vehicles, the, there are a lot of safety measures that, that they're putting in place, rightfully so, yeah. uh, to, to allow soldiers to safely operate their armies. So, you know, it's, it's obviously not something uh, that is effective in combat to have somebody walk in with an emergency stop around behind. Um, but, but that's part of the crawl, walk, run. Once we get to a point where the confidence, uh, the routine use of these things comes into play, uh, then it'll be just like M1s and, and Bradley's where we start to realize, okay, ground guide front and back uh, when I'm in an admin area, mm -hmm. uh, different things. Um, and then what you have here is the, the host of uh, power, uh, both input and outputs uh, for the, the, the vehicle itself. So you can charge this uh, with essentially a Tesla wall charger. Um, takes about the same amount of time as a, a Tesla does to fully charge it. Yeah. Um, but um, that's, that's what it all is right now. No um, option to quickly swap out the battery pack like uh, the Model S? No, uh, in, in fact, what you really find, uh, is, as you know, you know Tesla uh, was, was in the pursuit of uh, much longer charge times uh, and about a year and a half ago decided you know what we're going to invest more time in rapid charge mm -hmm. uh, because most people don't need their vehicles to go farther they need to be able to charge quicker and so that's that's the big challenge is converting electric energy to electric energy right now uh, it'll definitely be something that uh, comes to fruition before long uh, but for right now it's still uh, one of the challenges with electric vehicles which is why we are absolutely uh, convinced that that you have to have hydroelectric in at least in the near term. Yeah. I don't know. My last tour in Mosul, I didn't see many heart superchargers uh, on the street. So well, I mean, somebody's going to look at all that open flat space and say, "Can you put a solar panel on the top?" Probably would. Uh, and you know, I, I'm I old enough to remember where we had little solar panels that would trickle charge uh, the the tank the uh, batteries on a tank, but uh, we'll see. 
Uh, somebody will come up with an innovative design, but for right now, uh, the, the size of battery packs required to, to drive a 12 and a half ton vehicle uh, are such that uh, it's not easily swappable. I'm assuming these aren't uh, water jets or anything. Does this thing swim? This one does not. Uh, there are capabilities out there uh, where, you know, obviously uh, Textron Systems uh, has designed the advanced reconnaissance vehicle for the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So we have pedigree in making vehicle, armored vehicles swim, uh, and we have designs where that capability uh, is built in. So but I'm looking at what it is not else? on this. Now this is just those are just uh, vent louvers. All right. Fair enough. I don't. I think there's anything immediately offhand I, I haven't asked yet. So the you said it was a 30 or 35? It's a, it's a 30 by 113. And single feed? This one's just a single feed with proximity rounds. Uh, the, the 30 by 173 cannons that are installed on the, the vehicles that we deliver to the United States Army actually have dual feed. Right. So we have the radar on the front. Is that a search and track or both? It's a search and track. It's a, a dual mode AESC radar. Okay. Uh, so it'll track both incoming and outgoing targets. And what that allows it to do is take feeds from AMDUs and then uh, actually true the rounds as it's going out. So. And does it also queue perhaps with uh, radio signal signals intelligence? Say, hey, there's radio frequencies from a drone coming from this direction, or is that a, a different capability? For it's a different vehicle? capability. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of additional things that you guys may ask. It's kind of, I don't know. I don't hang around with robotic vehicles very much. Yeah. <laughs> well, not too many people do. It's a new thing. And, and one of the things that is interesting about being in this space uh, is it's not like uh, the OMFE program where it's designed to replace the Bradley or, uh, you know, the next generation of tank. Uh, there is no space currently in the, in the formation. And so that's one of the things that the Army is trying to figure out is where do these fit in the formation? Uh, so how, and how are they going to utilize them? How many of them are they going to have in a battalion sort of thing? It, that's, that's one yeah. of the challenges that the Army is trying to figure out right now. Uh, and there's a variety of different uh, uh, concepts. You know, I spent uh, most of my three decades in uniform uh, in cavalry formations. Mm -hmm. So I would love to have something like this as a reconnaissance and security platform that I could push out ahead in almost silent capability yeah. and engage the enemy with lethal force if I wanted to or simply use the situational awareness gain from the sensors to then feed that back through my battle management systems. Uh, so there's a whole variety of different ways that, that these can be employed. Uh, and, and ultimately the Army's gonna have to figure out what's the best way for these vehicles to uh, augment uh, our manned formations uh, and really to pull soldier risk out of the riskiest places in the battlefield. Are any of the other countries looking at it? The Brits, the Israelis, any other? There's a variety of countries uh, that are very interested in, in robotic combat systems. Uh, you know, and just like we're interested in it, uh, again, pulling soldier risk out of those risky places uh, is something that we've endeavored to do. Uh, it's why the tank was built at first, yeah. right? Uh, you know, that helped to mitigate the, the challenges of tank warfare during World War I. Fast forward, heavy armor in our M1 fleet uh, is something that gives us an advantage to even take a punch, but keep going uh, against our adversaries today. Um, this allows you to, to go a little bit different way by taking a step back completely, not having a crew inside so that while these are not inexpensive, uh, you know, if this vehicle is taken out, I'm not uh, losing four lives, um, and that that cost in terms of, of human uh, value is pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, my personal opinion, uh, I, I think these are great wing tanks, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it'll be a long time before you get rid of the manned ones. That's just I, me. I don't think, uh, you know, we have lethality systems uh, that are designed to do things, but what it does is it augments capability that uh, that we currently don't have in our formations. Gotcha. So the ones that we deliver to the U.S. Army actually have uh, a quadcopter on board, and as you saw on the front uh, with the camera shot, we have the small unmanned ground vehicle gotcha. that allows you to, you know, prosecute culverts, uh, looking for IEDs, things like that. And is that carried by this vehicle? It is. Uh, so the the front uh, of the the vehicle actually has a garage and it drops down, uh, and then the the marsupial small and ground, unmanned ground vehicle drives out, uh, is controlled by the host, it goes and does what it needs to do, and then it comes back up and inductively charges in that little garage. 
just like your iPhone. All right, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then go back and insert a B-roll now of this. Yeah. All right, well, I think I've about taken up enough of your time, so thanks for the tour. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> it always happens. <laughs> it always happens. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Three times? Yeah. Uh.